And a fine good morning to all of you subscribers. Russ Barkley back again with another Saturday Research Review. This week we've got four articles to talk about, but before we do, as always, some really bad dad jokes. These come to us from the website menshealth.com. So here's a couple for you, and then we'll get busy on the research. Up first is never date a tennis player. Love means nothing to them. <laughs> Think about it. Come on, you tennis players will get that one. Hey, what's a lawyer's favorite drink? A subpoena colada. Oh, now that's sick. That, that's pretty bad. And finally, what did Yoda say when he saw himself in 4K? HDMI. Think now. Come on, you tech-savvy people. You should be getting that. Okay, enough of these bad dad jokes. Let's move along to our first article. And this is an article that was published over in Current Psychology. It's a meta-analysis of the effects of exercise on inhibition or inhibitory control in children with ADHD. Now, mind you, they're not looking at all of the symptoms, just at the impulse control or inhibitory ones. So the authors who are out of China reviewed all of the literature they could find and they identified 18 papers involving more than 700 participants. And when they did their meta-analysis of all of these studies, they found something pretty interesting. First of all, they found that a single type of aerobic exercise or playing ball games were both significantly better than the exercises done in the control group. They found that when you looked at them individually, ball games were the best. They were better than the individual or than the combined forms of aerobic exercise. I'm not sure I would have guessed that. But remember, they're focusing exclusively on inhibition. So for inhibitory control, looks like playing some sort of ball game, soccer, baseball, what have you, might just be the ticket to helping with control of inhibitory symptoms. So nice meta-analysis there out of China. Our next article comes from Japan. This was published over in Frontiers in Psychiatry, and it's a large population study involving more than 15,000 individuals. And it's looking at the relationship of ADHD to other coexisting psychiatric disorders. Now, this is pretty old news. We've been studying comorbidity in ADHD for quite some time. But to have a study come out of Japan that essentially replicates what we've seen in other more Western countries well, that's noteworthy, I think. And so in this study, they found that if individuals with had ADHD in children, the most common comorbidity was being on the autism spectrum. That's kind of interesting because over here in the U.S., the most common comorbidity is probably oppositional defiant disorder. And then we would see autism spectrum disorder in probably about 20 to 25 percent of the kids. And even then it would be toward the higher end of the spectrum. But ODD would be found in 65% or more of clinic referred children. Now, the reason that these figures may be different is, first of all, it's Japan. And they may have more of a proclivity for recognizing autism spectrum over oppositional disorder. So it could be something cultural there. Uh, the second thing is that this is a population study not a study of clinic-referred individuals. And it may be that within the Japanese population, the comorbidity patterns are a little different. But what I really found gratifying here was that most people with ADHD experienced at least one or more comorbidities. Now, in the adult population with ADHD, the most common comorbidity was, no surprise, mood disorders. Here in the U.S., it would probably be anxiety disorders, followed by depression or, more likely, the milder version of dysthymia. But over there, it looks like mood disorders being depression would be a bit more common as a comorbidity. Now, they did the reverse. They went and looked at other people who had other psychiatric disorders, 
and then looked at the prevalence of ADHD with each of those other disorders. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what they found is that among the children who had oppositional disorder, ADHD was the number one comorbidity occurring in <clears throat> well over 70% of those individuals. Excuse me this morning, a little gravelly here today. <clears throat> Hopefully we'll get over that real quick. All right, so a nice study on comorbidity over there in Japan. We're going to move along now toward our third paper. This is a study on early emotion regulation difficulties and their developmental trajectory over time relative <clears throat> to risk of ADHD symptoms, internalizing problems, and conduct problems. So this is a big study that was done out of the University of Edinburgh uh, over in the UK. And it is a study that also involved thousands of children being followed over time. What the authors found in this paper was that higher initial levels of emotion dysregulation and lower reductions over time of such regulation problems at the entry in the study was very predictive of difficulties with ADHD at ages three, five, and seven year old follow-up. They also found that early problems with emotion regulation were also predictive of later conduct problems, not to mention what are called internalizing problems, which basically represent symptoms of anxiety and depression and so forth. They found that this was the case in both males and females. So what is this telling us? Early difficulties with regulating emotion could be early risk factors for the later identification of ADHD symptoms and conduct problems, not to mention other internalizing symptoms. So that's important because, you know, prior to the 1990s, we did not recognize emotion dysregulation as being a part of ADHD. It was thought to simply come along with the comorbid disorders that might be there. But starting in the 1990s, I, along with several other investigators, <clears throat> excuse me, began publishing research reviews and original research as well, showing that difficulties with emotion regulation were as common in both children and adults with ADHD as were any of the DSM symptoms, the classic symptoms of the disorder. Moreover, we argued that this was as much an inherent part of ADHD as were attention, distractibility, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Indeed, I argued that part of the emotion dysregulation was indeed related to the behavioral inhibition problems, while the difficulties with downregulating strong emotions once they were provoked was more related to self-regulation, the executive functions. So what is so nice about this paper is not only is it replicating the earlier research and coming out of the UK as well, but it's also showing us that early emotion dysregulation may be predictive of ADHD and other problems later in childhood, showing that it's a very important component of ADHD and probably other disorders as well. So uh, a nice paper there over in development and psychopathology. My last paper is coming to us from Spain. This is a study that was done and published over in the uh, article, or excuse me, the research journal, Carey's Research, a dental journal. And it is a study of a large sample of Spanish children looking at those with ADHD specifically. We're gonna scroll down here. They had more than 3,400 children between six and 14 years of age that they pulled out of the National Spanish Health Survey database. And what they found is that those with ADHD were found to have more difficulties with dental caries, to be more at risk for having teeth extracted, to be more at risk for having their teeth restored, and to have a higher risk for gingival bleeding, bleeding of the gums. So this replicates 
studies that originally were done in Sweden and found this association of ADHD with poor dental hygiene as well as risk for dental problems that had been replicated after that over here in the U.S. and now we see it replicated yet again in Spain. So there's obviously something about ADHD related to poor dental health, probably related to poor dental hygiene, but we know that the risks for um, extraction or for restoration could also be coming from the greater risk-taking behavior that leads to dental trauma, okay? So some very nice papers there for you this week. I hope you enjoyed hearing about them. Um, I know I certainly enjoyed reading them. And as always, I'll see you again in another week for another research review. Uh, and in the meantime, as always, think about subscribing if you haven't. But also, as I always conclude, live well, be well, and take care. Bye, everybody.